Uh, first of all, I'd like to say thank you to Jason. Jason will be leading the interview at the start, and then I will just pop back and uh, moderate the questions from the audience. So the way we're going to structure this evening is Jason and Munro are going to have a conversation for the first half of the event, but we also want lots of engagement with you as well, so you can ask her questions in the second half of the event. Without further ado, for tonight's guest, Munro is a model and social activist. She's fronted multiple successful campaigns as a model and currently features on the Huffington Post and AOL's new online series, New Activists. It is an honor to welcome her to speak this evening at the Cambridge Union. Please give a warm welcome to Munro Bergdorf. Hi. <laughs> hi. Uh, hi, Monroe. Hi. So, a lot of the audience will know you from your work as a social activist. Yes. Uh, could you explain to us what that means to you and what that involves? So, hi, everyone. <laughs> um, so, a lot of my work is focused around race and gender, but I don't necessarily like to think of um, my work as just that. I like to be there as an ally for um, anyone experiencing religious intolerance or um, anything that isn't necessarily my own struggle. So, I say social activist because I like to be there for other people, not just speak about things that matter to me. <laughs> it's just a short answer, basically. <laughs> um, I, uh, originally, I did just speak about gender, and then I started seeing um, my experience as more of a holistic experience, and then I discovered intersectional feminism and um, realized that you can't actually separate um, gender from race, that it's, you know, they're two of the same, and black history has so much to do with, um, you know, um, black women, and um, all of our experiences are linked. So I just say social activist because I think it allows me to speak about how, um, especially my, um, my um, ancestors have had such an impact on society today. So, yeah. I think particularly, like, I'm interested in particularly in like how you've become like an emergent voice um, leading on trans issues particularly. Um, but as a black gay man myself, I'm interested in what you ascribe to the importance of the intersection between black and queer and trans identity mm. and what place that has in black Britain as well. Well, I think just because we don't really speak about um, black queerness uh, as a society, I think that we're starting to, but um, especially within um, LGBT culture, I mean, black um, women especially have been so um, important to um, gay liberation because, you know, there wasn't a distinction between um, trans and gay. We were, it was just all of the same to um, people that weren't LGBT. So um, it's really important to me to speak about history, uh, people like, you know, Sylvia Riviera and... Um, Marsha P. Johnson especially, um, who was so integral to the gay rights movement. Um, but even, you know, um, vocal culture and issues of appropriation, um, which still are a major problem within the LGB LGBT community, and also that we have a huge problem with racism within the LGBT community that we don't talk about either. So um, I think it's just really changing the narrative and just making sure that we're speaking about the things that we don't necessarily speak about and the inconvenient things that we don't really want to speak about either. I think that there needs to be people that are willing to put their head above the parapet and get shot if needs be. And um, anyone who is strong enough to use their platform to um, speak about these, pro um, these um, issues, they should do because more time after time we're seeing people that can't handle it get thrown into the media spotlight and then crumble and then nothing changes because people don't know what to say and I'm, I'm lucky enough that I can use my voice and that I, I feel strong enough most of the time <laughs> to deal with it. Not all the time, but most of the time. Yeah, and I think that's like particularly important, particularly like complicating narratives around queer people of mm. colour and looking at like how we're going to look at like the fact that like the higher proportions of LGBT homeless people are yeah. black youth or that like access to HIV care is something which is uh, particularly Absolutely. low. Um, but next question. So Caitlin Jenner spoke at the Cambridge Union uh -huh. earlier this term uh, about sharing her experiences. And how do you balance sharing your story and choosing how you share your story in a world of media that often characterizes a few individuals as speaking for a whole diverse community? Yeah, well, that's the key, isn't it? You don't speak over people past the mic. 
don't um, speak for people past the mic. I think it's really, really important. I mean, I'm asked about um, non-binary, the non-binary experience a lot, and I just say, why don't you ask a non-binary person? They're like, well, you've got more of a profile. You should be using your platform to raise awareness. And I don't want to speak about things that I don't experience. It's like asking a man to exper um, explain feminism is patronizing, and really, it doesn't really push anything forward because you're not hearing it from the horse's mouth. So um, I definitely feel that um, we need to be speaking about our individual experiences, speaking about things that matter to us individually, but also, you know, just saying, why don't you speak to a black trans woman about her experience rather than asking a white woman to come and speak for a black woman doesn't really make any sense. But um, yeah, I mean, I'm asked about Caitlin a lot and I really respect her as a person, um, but I do think that we need to be looking at the notion of privilege within the communities, um, looking at the fact that we, ca we we need to be pulling people up rather than just air, oh, like kind of looking over certain things. So, yeah. Cool. Uh, so moving on the conversation. So alongside your work as a social activist, yeah. you are also a very fabulous model and very prominent in the beauty very industry. Very fabulous, thank you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so beauty industry is like very like problematic for us, diversity yeah. problems, but Edward Ellenfield has come and taken over the fashion Bible Vogue and the work that he's doing on that magazine Thank God is as well. seen as like, <laughs> incredible. So what are your thoughts on diversity in fashion, on Edward Ellenfield's appointment, like the future of fashion? Mm -hmm. Do you ever see yourself gracing Vogue magazine one day? Well, I mean, I'd love to. <laughs> <laughs> I l I'd love to, obviously. But um, yeah, I mean, the thing about the beauty industry is it's, it can be really, really bad, but it can also be really great. And I don't necessarily think that the beauty industry needs to go away, it just needs to be more ethical and inclusive and considerate of the people that we don't really have a, con we don't really have a decision um, whether or not we consume the media, we don't have a decision whether we want to consume the beauty industry, it's just there. So um, it's so ingrained within society that we just need to make sure that these subliminal messages that are being put out there about how we should look, how we should feel, how we should carry ourselves, how, what weight we should be, what clothes we should wear, we need to make sure that that's as ethical and as correct as possible, really, that no one feels alienated by it. So I see myself as someone that can be within this industry that can, you know, call out things that need to change or um, help people um, figure out on a consultancy level, which I've been doing behind the scenes as well, about how they can drive their brand um, in a more considerate way. And I think, I mean, a big problem is that behind the scenes is not as diverse as the, what's being put in front of the camera. Um, it's all well and good, you know, wanting to appeal to an LGBT audience and um, having LGBT people on screen, but then there's nobody LGBT behind the camera and then it just being put out into the public um, consciousness and people are like, what's this? Um, I mean, we can see that with, like, it wasn't LGBT so much, it was just everybody. Um, with the Pepsi thing and Caitlyn and Jenner, and, yeah, Caitlyn Jenner, sorry, and he's a Kay, Caitlyn Kardashian, <laughs> Caitlyn Jenner. Um, and it's not so much, you know, that anyone in that uh, campaign wanted to hurt anybody, it just wasn't run by anybody, or people felt like they couldn't speak up. I don't know what it was, but I think that it could have definitely been... Um, the, the fallout could have been reduced if they just had somebody consulting on the project or if the team was as diverse as the people that it was being pushed to. Yeah, and we've seen that recently with, like, they've been accused of racist advert after racist advert as yeah. well. Yeah. And the thing with racism, and half the time it's not even intentionally to do people harm, it's just enforcing narratives that are already there. So if we want to change that, then we need to make sure that we are active in doing so. And being active in doing so is offering opportunities to people and making sure that, you know, oh, I didn't realize that, you know, the workplace is like majority white people. Um, we need to be active. If you're not conscious in um, diversity, then it's just going to be tokenism. Yeah. Um, so you have spoken about how racism is not just calling someone something, it's mm. a whole system. So do you think an industry based on looks can meaningfully engage with these conversations and break down the system you reference and how does it achieve this? So an industry based on looks? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, like I said, if 
it's um, if you're putting someone in the camera just in front of the camera just based on how they look, but you're not going into um, kind of their thoughts or allowing them to have a voice. I mean, as you can see what happened with L'Oreal, I mean, I'm sure that you're, you're all aware what happened, so we won't go over that again. <laughs> um, you need to, if you're going to be speaking about diversity, if you're going to be speaking about inclusion, then you can't just tell that person, don't speak about that, don't actually speak about why we need inclusion, why we need diversity. Start speaking about the very real problems that are within the beauty industry as well. I mean, the whole, I was um, being asked to speak about um, the shade that I was um, advertising, um, which um, was a shade that wasn't actually on um, offer at, up to that point by L'Oreal. So um, the reason why that shade wasn't on um, the shelves is because of lack of diversity, lack of inclusivity. Brands didn't think that there was a... Um, that there was a revenue for um, a makeup product advertising it to women like myself. So um, I was speaking about racism, the source of racism, which is obviously white supremacy, and it's also right, um, putting um, whiteness at a greater pinnacle than um, blackness. So, um, and then that was too much. So I think that if brands are going to be giving um, or going to be using um, black models, then they need to be allowing those models to um, offer empowerment to the people that they're selling the product to. I think that um, brands have that responsibility to their customers. Yeah, and I think the issue really is that whiteness has always been seen as like neutral and invisible. Yeah, the default. It, yeah, the default, and it's only diversity when it's people of color, mm -hmm. and then when you then like lift the blanket and reveal whiteness for what it is, you're then the bad person because you've like revealed, you've made this like big yeah. scary statement and you've like shaken It's shooting people. the messenger, um, yeah. really, because I mean, I'm not the first person to have said what I said, and I won't be the last person, unfortunately, yeah. either. So, um, and I'm glad that it breaks through to the public, public consciousness and the mainstream. Um, uh, but I think that the reason why it blew up so much is because I was using language that was quite often um, used within an echo chamber. Um, I think that, you know, um, words such as microaggressions or intersectionality, unfortunately, aren't really in the public domain so much, um, especially when it comes to advertising. So it was kind of a case of light in the match and watching it all burn down a little bit. Uh, but I think we need these situations. and. I'm just glad that I am strong enough and self-aware enough to actually deal with it because I really do worry about if I wasn't able to articulate myself in the way that I can or if I didn't have as strong a family unit as I do or if I didn't have access to um, the things that I have had, had, have had access to for the whole of my life. I mean, I have been lucky enough to um, have been educated and raised not too far away from Cambridge, which is a very lucky place to have been um, exposed to during my formative years. And if I hadn't have had that sta strong, stable upgrade, oh God, I just said strong and stable. Oh. <laughs> God. Um, if I hadn't have had that upbringing, then um, I don't know what um, I would have done. Yeah. I think that that really does worry me. Um, and I think that that's what the media was hoping I wasn't going to be able to pull through on. Yeah. Because um, the media, unfortunately, does have a track record of tearing black women down, especially when it comes to people that don't identify within the heteronormative um, identities within society. And so what do you think, moving forward, how can we make sure that we have our conversations on whiteness? Um, even though they are going like, to inspire like, such vivid responses, you get accusations of being divisive, of like, reverse mm. racism, and in the end, white people end up reinforcing the systems which you're trying to break down and really trying to get through. So yeah. how can we make sure that the messages which we put out are constructive, mm. even if they are going to face backlash, which they always will because of white supremacy? Yeah. Um, but what kind of what can we do moving forward as like young race activists, as like people of colour in the room to inspire in this conversation move this forward? Yeah. Well, I mean, really, this is where we realise that it racism involves all of us. And that it isn't just on people of colour to be the frontiers of the race debate. We you can't put all of we can't put all of that pressure on people of colour to always explain that their oppression. Um, it's not fair and it doesn't really go anywhere when you're just being met with deaf ears. So really, this is where white people need to A, check their privilege and B, be an ally. Um, so it's not an, 
enough just listening or watching YouTube. It's actually going out there into the world and using your privilege for good and um, making a change yourself. It can be so small as calling out your racist uncle at Christmas. That really is how small it could be. Or checking a racist joke, or just going onto YouTube and listening to activists on YouTube, just getting ready for, you know, when you hear someone have a racist outburst on public transport, or whatever. We've all seen racism be enacted in the smallest of ways. Um, but it's just being that person to stop it from going any further because you let someone think that they can get away with it once and then they'll go and get away with it again. And then that's the unfortunate thing about oppression is when someone feels uncertain or unstable within their existence, there's the tendency in whatever gender or race or class to oppress the other or um, ostracize someone to make you feel like you're more stable within yourself. So um, just call it out. Just be that person to stop it, because if you don't, then it'll continue. I think it's really important that you emphasize that this like, does involve all of us, because a lot of the time, it's kind of response we get as well, I'm not racist, like, how can it be me? Mm. And people have this idea that, like, I think it's funny that some, like, sometimes white people will think that they can grow up in a really racist society and be socialized in it and actually hold no racism whatsoever. Like, yeah. even black people are proven, there are like so many psychological studies mm. which show black people even internalize racism against themselves, but because everyone is so determined to look like this good person, they'd yeah. rather not interrogate themselves, they'd rather, you know, pretend to be like, you know, I'm not racist at all I'm like totally perfect and that's really really hard to crack actually it is hard to crack but I think people need to be aware that none of us are above society people are society and none of us are above sociological constructs you know we're all exposed to the patriarchy we're all exposed to racism we're all exposed to um, class we're all exposed to gender like we cannot get away from these things we can enlighten ourselves to stop ourselves from becoming part of the problem and part of oppressive structures, but we can't ever break out of it, unfortunately, because, I mean, we can, we can you know, choose not to participate in it, but we're all going to be exposed to it, and we've all been exposed to it within our formative years. So there's always going to be that sense of, um, you know, um, unlearning. Um, men have to unlearn not to be sexist, not to enforce gender roles. Women need to learn to not... Um, that you know, being part of the ge um, gender roles or constructs isn't going to be beneficial to their mental well-being half the time, um, and you know, um, people of colour have to unlearn internalised things as well. I mean, I haven't always been like this. There's um, there was a time when I definitely tried to um, conform to white beauty ideals. The um, idols that I had in the media were white. Um, I didn't, definitely didn't have any trans women of colour to look up to. That just wasn't a thing. Um, and then I realised, you know, had a little bit of a self-affirming moment that happened over about three years, that if I wanted to actually see some change, then I would have to stick my head above the parapet and do it myself. Um, and then around the same time that I started to be being more vocal, I think other people were having that moment. I think it was a bit of a tipping point around 2014, 15, just before Caitlin um, came out, but it was around that time as well, with Laverne and Janet Mock as well. Janet Mock, I don't know what I would have done without that book. I needed that book at that time. So when I'm getting um, people as young as 12, 14 messaging me, I had an 11 year old the other day message me on Twitter, um, just speaking about how much what I'm doing means to them, then I don't take that lightly because I know how much it means to be able to see yourself in the media, because the media, we don't have a choice in consuming that either. Um, it's so important that people have um, role options. Um, not role models, really. Um, I have people say that I'm a role model to them, and if that's what they want to call me, then that's fine, but I would never refer, refer to myself as a role model. Um, I'm a role option. If you see yourself in me, then that's fantastic. Uh, but I don't, want to, I don't want anyone to feel like they should have to be an activist or they should have to um, be this outspoken, because half the time people can't be. There's a matter of safety. There's a matter of um, self-assurance, uh, family, um, everything can be um, too much sometimes. So um, if you can see yourself in me, then that's fantastic. Yeah, so many important points there. And I think a big takeaway is this idea that, like, 
it's not really enough to be not racist, you have to be anti-racist, and you have to be actively unlearning sure. the things which you've been conditioned to learn since birth. Um, but one last question, so reflecting on your work to make positive impact, and as we've seen you go from strength to strength since what happened over the summer, what kind of advice would you give to students here tonight who are looking to make a positive impact in their career? Because often there's a difficulty between re reconciling your political self and your mm. self, which is so like interested in engaging with the social world and having a career. Like lots of people are like, oh, what's my employer going to think if they see me ranting against white supremacy or talking mm. about like how men are sexist? So what advice would you give to students in here? Um, I would say activism can be as small or as big as your life can allow. Um, but there really does need to be a limit, if you know what I mean. Um, I think that it's all about your message and also recognizing that if you can't do something, there's other people that can. And that you are a cog within a machine and a movement. You are not the movement yourself. There will be people that have said what you feel and what you think before you. Tap into that and find other people that, have, that feel that way also. So if you can't speak about something in a public um, domain, there will be someone else that can and support that person as well and you could work together and you can offer something that that person can do that that other person can't do as well. So it's really just teamwork. Um, and also, if you feel like you need to take it all on yourself, you don't. Um, you, I mean, self-care is a huge thing that is so important. I was just saying um, to a member of the press upstairs, like, they asked me how I self-care, and I mean, I'm a bit a bit weird sometimes, I carry around a candle that I really, really like, <laughs> and just like go around someone's house where we're watching a movie and just light the candle. <laughs> just because I think that scent and sensory things, sensory things are so important. Sex is important. Human touch is important. Food is important. Smell is so important that we don't even realize it. Just familiar feelings are important. So just hacking into what makes you happy as well as what you're impassioned about. Um, don't always feel like it needs to be the hard line. Sometimes activism is a slow burner and you can't you know, go at things a thousand miles per hour because there's going to be a thousand miles per hour pushback. So... Um, I'm in the position where I can speak about things and be a little bit harsher because there's a backstory that people can instantly see. But um, unfortunately, we live in a society that does take things on face value. So um, be really concerned with your message and how you get it across. Um, but don't dilute it at the same time. It's about being conscious but not over-analytic. -anal about what you want to put across. There's so many levels, um, so just at me at Twitter if you want, <laughs> if you want me to run by anything. But um, yeah, definitely just teamwork, <coughs> realizing your communities. The black community is a marvelous thing. The queer community is a marvelous thing. Just realizing that we're all in it together and that racism isn't just something that black people need to deal with, that all that South Asian or East Asian people need to deal with. It involves all of us, and it involves all of us coming together to unite as one. So we can have Utopia, finally, <laughs> eventually. <laughs> Jason and Munro for that really interesting discussion. I hope that's inspired a lot of questions as well. Um, and just a hand for them both there for going through. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> And I know we've had a lot of questions that were sent in beforehand. Lots of people have been talking about this event and so excited to welcome you to Cambridge. And everyone here tonight, we would like to take as many questions as we can, time permitting. The only thing I'd ask is that if you can wait for a steward to bring you a microphone, both so that everyone in the room and up here that we can hear it as well, that would be really appreciated. So would anyone like to um, ask a question of Munro, if you just want to raise hands or... I've also got a lot that have been sent in on Twitter during the discussion as well. Um, if we want to start with the question just here. Um, uh, thank you so much, Monroe, for presenting such an illuminating discussion on oh, a whole you. bunch of societal issues. Um, so you mentioned the role of white people in activism and yeah. what that looks like. And what I've wondered is, what is the um, distinction between using your privilege um, to kind of unfortunately have a bigger platform and to speak on issues on race and gender and things like that, but then at the same time 
not um, talking over people of colour and passing the mic, like where does that line, um, where is that line? Because I think often it's, it's blurred. I think unfortunately the line is blurred sometimes when it comes to ego. And, you know, um, it's recognising, oh, this would be a great opportunity for me, or this would be a great opportunity for another person who maybe doesn't have the platform that I have, but, you know, elevate them, just allow them. I mean, there's a lot of things that I'm asked to do, as I said, that if I do them, then, yeah, it's just, it's, I've already got the platform, at, but what, what's the need for me to be speaking on a topic that doesn't really involve me when I know other people that can? And um, it's just, you know, selfishness half the time, unfortunately. And money is another factor. Um, I'm constantly asked to do um, television appearances um, that other people could benefit from. And, um, I mean, when it comes to gender as well, um, you need to weigh up how constructive it's going to be. Um, there's, you know, I'm sure that you're all aware of TERFs and trans exclusionary rad radical feminists who um, want to denounce um, trans, trans women's um, presence within feminism. Um, I'm asked to do that a lot and debate with these people when, and I just tell um, producers that in offering these women a platform, you're actively participating within the narrative that trans women don't have a place within feminism because you're giving them a platform you're allowing this narrative to continue. If you want to be part of the change, you can't allow these people a platform because it's not helping anything. But time after time, we see activists play into this and go on television. And um, it really, that's, this, is, this is where it takes all of us to just say no. We're not going to debate with these people. We're not going to negotiate with terrorists, basically. It, it's not constructive, and it goes nowhere. It's just scan, it's a scandal, basically, so that people who aren't educated on the subject can see um, a heated discussion, and that's not what we want. We want people actively changing people's minds. Um, so, yeah, that's where I think it could go. A question that we've had in online, which a lot of people have asked, is about uh, to ask you, from your time involved as an activist, what is one thing that you've learned the most from, from that journey? What's been a, a really big lesson to you? Um, I, it would definitely be that if I'm not being good to myself, then I'm no use to anybody else. Um, I'm lucky that I get to travel um, a lot with work, and mm. it's kind of gone to... Um, places that I never thought that I would get to work in, like with um, recent events. But um, so just realizing what makes you happy, um, self-care, 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 um, realizing um, the strength of my sisterhood, um, the, um, the strength and the uh, unity of the um, black community is incredible. Um, I'm, I, I wouldn't be able to get through it without um, the support that black women have shown me, or black femmes even, um, who know what it's like to constantly be doubted or denounced or um, spoken over. Um, and also just seeing how um, open a lot of um, allies and white um, allies have been especially, and just saying, um, you've changed my mind or you've mm -hmm. um, opened my eyes to this subject. Um, and what you said at first, I thought it was really, really harsh, but I actually took the time to um, look it up and listen to people, because that's really all that I can hope for, is um, someone actually going out there and taking the time to go and do this themselves and look up what can be done themselves, rather than just saying, Monroe, what can I do to help things? There's all of this information that's already out there, and it's been out there for decades. And it really can be as small as just Googling and, or going onto YouTube. And I hate saying that because it sounds so passive aggressive, but it really is that simple sometimes. And there's so many bloggers, people that are offering their voice out there. YouTube is a huge thing mm. um, where activism is thriving um, and people offering um, their opinions or different perspectives out there. That, but they're not, they don't have the platform to um, you know, go and write something um, out in a newspaper, or newspapers are too scared to be given um, you know, the radicals or the people that really have the clout within the community to write these articles. So yeah, just 
yeah, <laughs> yeah <laughs> there's, so, there's so many different things that we could talk about. I think it, it's so interesting and it is so inspiring to hear about how many people have felt they can reach out to you, whether that's messaging you yeah. on Twitter, but also for them to get back to you and say, actually, what yeah. you said has made me think mm. I've gone away and, and worked at it and come back to let you yeah. know. That must feel incredible to know that you've been yeah. a part of that change. It means a lot, especially yeah. with um, recently the, the flack that trans kids have been getting in the media is just awful. And the amount of kids that contact me as well mm. just means a lot as well. And I suppose that's one thing that having a greater profile, the that incredible change you can have may not be something that straight away you would have been aware would have mm. happened. In the scope of everything in your work with activism, with modeling, everything that you've done, as Jason said, going from strength to strength, what would you say the best experience, if you could choose one, has been over the past couple of years? Um, mm. You know what, as hard as it has actually been, I've, and it's been a real process to get there, um, I don't want to say that the whole L'Oreal thing was a blessing in disguise because it really wasn't a blessing. It was institutionalized racism. <laughs> but um, I think it really forced me to step up and it was an obstacle and I feel like it was a really good experience for me. Um, I mean, activism is saying the um, uncomfortable things. It's um, going against the general consensus really. Um, and um, yeah, I think that it, it was an obstacle. I'm really proud of myself that I was able to overcome and um, give other people strength. So really, I would say that the last two and a half months have been a really good time, really. I don't think that um, what's the point in life if we're not challenging ourselves? <laughs> and it was a real crash course in the media. Um, but I'm glad that it can be a case study so that this kind of thing won't happen verbatim again. Mm. Um, it might happen in different entities and different areas, but at least they can say, wait a minute, this is exactly the same as what happened to Monroe, it's just in a different cloak. Um, I'm glad that we can have that narrative out there. Mm. It's, it's really interesting, the constructive way in which you spin yeah. it, and the fact that that question about what has been your best experience is one that came in a lot on my Yeah, I mean, it pretty much was like the world was ending for a good week. It was really, really bad, but I'm, I'm glad that I've got a good team around me now and yes. that we can um, carry this on mm. undisrupted. To no, an and, and like, I am, um, we're so grateful that you are you know, coming about, coming to Cambridge, speaking to us ab about it and mm. to hear about what you've done. That's, that's it, I don't want to be a celebrity to be, to an extent. I mean, to, I mean, obviously I was working in the fashion industry and the beauty industry, but being a celebrity isn't of interest to me to a certain extent. If I'm not, I, I can take the platform and mm. I'll, I'll always use the platform, mm. but I'm not interested in just turning up to parties or that kind of thing or yeah. just DJing um, all the time. I just want to be doing things to actually get out there and meet people and change things and um, spark discussions and use the celebrity aspect, but not just, you know, fall into the comfort of that. And I think we have time for a couple more questions. Sorry, tell floor. me to stop talking so that I can just no, answer not at more. All. <laughs> uh, I think we've got one at the back there, just in the back left. Hi, thank you so much for your talk. Hi. Um, I was wondering what you thought about the conflation or the, the grouping of sexuality and gender in LGBT. Okay. Um, I think it's important that the T stays in LGBT. Um, I feel like there's a difference between um, highlighting the distinction between gender and sexuality than segregating the fact that our histories are linked and we can't get away from that. Um, I think that is hugely important in keeping the T in LGBT because it was trans women, that without trans women, we wouldn't have the gay liberation movement. Um, so uh, we need to just you know, work together and there's not gonna be any point in segregating the T from LGBT because it's going to take all of us to progress. Um, and we've got so much to learn from each other. We are a community that largely crosses over. You can be T and G, you can be T and B. Um, 
you can be T and non-binary, you know? Um, it's, it's super important that we all do stick together because we've come this far together and we should go forward together. And do we have any more questions? I think just that on the right-hand side. Hi. Hi. Um, thank you again. Um, given that the fashion industry is one which privileges uh, white cis women's bodies or, mm -hmm. or men's bodies, what are the sort of ethical considerations that you have to take into account before you decide to say yes to a job or turn a job down? Um, yeah, and what are the sort of processes that go through your mind in that situation? Um, I'm hugely um, aware of the fact that I'm a light-skinned black woman, and I know that I'm offered um, opportunities based on the way that I look and what I represent within um, marketable marketability, um, and I'm hugely aware of um, that um, opportunities are not given to dark-skinned black women, especially with dark-skinned black women with natural hair, on the same rate. So I'm really, really mindful about how campaigns look, and if you are just putting a mixed race girl in there to fulfill the black quota, then that's not enough. You need to be making sure that people are represented on all scales. Um, ableism is another thing that I'm hugely aware of that um, people don't even think about. And that up until you know about two years ago, I didn't think about, and it's not a reflection on whether or not you're a good person, it's just being aware that you have a privilege that we are all privileged in a certain way. Everybody in this room is privileged, so in some way or another. So it's just identifying um, the fact that there are people below uh, you in social structures that need pulling up. Um, so that's just generally um, two things that I'm aware of. Um, and also being aware of um, the history of companies. Had I been aware of um, a lot of things that L'Oreal do within the world, probably wouldn't have signed with them, and that's an oversight on my part, but it was a lesson on my part as well. Um, but yeah, just constantly evolving as a person. Um, I learn a ton, <laughs> um, and I think that a lot of people learn a ton from me as well, and just being so more socially aware um, more aware um, ethically as a consumer. Um, what are you spending your money on? Um, what's on the bottles that you consume? Um, as we saw with Dove, um, marketing their bottles with normal to dark skin. Um, just seeing things, and once you, you do, do you know what I mean? It's 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 balmy. You you look in like hair, sh hair and beauty shops when you go and get like your like cocoa butter and you can see like shelves and shelves of whitening products. It's just like calling things out and just saying, why is this a thing? Uh, because the more of us say, why is this a thing? It will stop actually being a thing. And I think we have time for one more question or oh, there are lots also. One that might be a nice one to close then that has been re retweeted quite a bit is asking about of what you can tell us, because I'm sure you've got a lot of projects going, what are you working on now? What are we likely to see you in in the next um, couple of months here <laughs> that you're allowed to tell us about? You see my manager just like <laughs> <laughs> beading through the gaps. <laughs> um, we've got some exciting stuff coming up that um, I can't necessarily speak about. I've got my first global campaign, which is coming out, which is really exciting with a brand which um, is um, and kind of like, <laughs> I mean, it's really, really, really cool. So that's coming out in December. Um, I'm doing a lot more talks, so mm -hmm. doing um, Oxford tomorrow and then speaking in Berlin on Thursday. Um, sorry, I don't know. <laughs> um, but yeah, I just, I really want to just be going out there and speaking in person rather than always having to be in a magazine format because I feel like actually going out there and engaging and people can hear how I speak rather than hearing it in their own voice, if you know what I mean, when you're reading it. So um, I think tone is such an important thing and tone is why we're here in the first place. <laughs> um, so yeah, just um, I think also when you're speaking to people who racism doesn't affect, aka white people, I think um, it's much easier to actually hear me speak rather than reading it uh, because you've got the option to put it down, whereas if you're hearing me, you don't have that option. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I just think just going out there and really getting my hands dirty 
we've got some television products that we're speaking about. Um, so I, I really don't want to say too much because it's all, <laughs> it's all in, in the works. But um, yeah, there's going to be some really interesting projects and I'm really excited for the year ahead. Excellent. Well, I'm sure we'll all be keeping an eye out for Thank those you. things as well. Um, if we could have a hand for Mumro, please. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.